turn to Revelation chapter 15. We're looking at Revelation 15 and 16 this morning. <laughs> Revelation chapter 15. Seven angels with seven plagues. I saw in heaven another great and marvellous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps, given them by God, and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seventh angel with seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. The one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels was, were completed. The seven bowls of God's wrath, chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath upon the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that of a dead person and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, O Holy One. You are and who are, were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophecies and you and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes. Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch the people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They were demonic spirits. They performed signs and they go out 
to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. I look, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. And then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with wine of the fury of its wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 40 kilograms, fell on the people, and they cursed God on the account of the plague of the hail, because the plague was so terrible. Right, if you keep those verses open, um, we're going to look at them together. Uh, just before we dive into the text and think about what it's saying, uh, I'm well aware that if this is the first time you've been here for a while, or the first time you've ever been here, you might have sat and thought, what on earth was that reading all about? Uh, don't worry if that's the, what your first thought was. There will be some people who've been here uh, for the entire Revelation series and will still have heard that verse, those verses read out and thought, what on earth is that talking about? Um, there's a lot of things to say. It's worth noting, if you've not been uh, in the last few uh, weeks or months, that Revelation in general is, is a picture book. So it is... Uh, John seeing visions and describing those visions and writing them down in the best words to describe them possible, but all of the stuff in those visions means something or points towards something. So it's true, but we would say it's not literal. So we're not literally looking for a dragon and a beast and a false prophet in some kind of magical way. It, it, is, it is true in that it's a picture of a reality. If that makes sense. If you want to ask me more about that later, you can do. It might become more clear as we look at chapter 15 and 16 together now. So, thinking about chapter 15 and 16, this is the question I want you to have in mind as we read it together, particularly in light of one of the later verses that we'll get to. Here's the question. Are you ready to meet Jesus? That's it. That's the question. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Because one day, everyone on the planet now and everyone who has ever lived will meet Jesus without exception. So there isn't really a more important question to ask than, am I ready to meet Jesus? Now, this is a cycle of seven balls, seven angels with seven balls. Uh, we've already seen, if you've been here for the last few months, uh, a cycle where there were seven seals on a scroll that were opened. There were then seven trumpets that were blown by seven angels. And now there are seven balls. When the seals were open, a quarter of the earth was affected. When the trumpets were opened, a third of the earth was affected. And now when the balls are poured out, all of the earth is Affected. There has been an increase in the intensity of what is taking place. Now, there's probably overlap. We've said there's overlap between the seals and the trumpets that they describe the same time between Jesus first coming when he was on earth as a man, lived, died, rose again from the dead, and when he'll come again. This cycle of seven balls does overlap with that, but I actually think it probably is concentrated more towards the end rather than covering the entire time. That's what I think from what it says, partly because we, we get to the end again, but partly because this is, it, it covers everything. It affects everything. 
I think what we are finding in chapters 15 and 16 is the expression again of God's wrath in time and space, but leading to the full expression in final judgment. Now, very briefly before we talk about that subject, because that is what is front and centre in these verses, the wrath of God. Look what John says he sees first, after he sees the seven angels and seven plagues. He says, what, he says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass, and the saints who had been victorious, who have overcome, who have resisted the beast and its image, are standing beside, or in some translations, on the sea of glass. Now, we've talked about before, haven't we, the sea often represented chaos and evil in this kind of literature. Now, what John sees is something like a sea that looks like glass. No longer tumultuous, no number choppy, no number, no number stormy kind of sea. This is a sea that looks like glass. And so I think what John is seeing here is that those who have been faithful, those who have persevered to the end, who have overcome in Jesus, actually now get to enjoy no more chaos, no more evil, but calm, because the sea now looks like glass. Which brings us to that big subject, probably a word, if you're a Christian, that you think, right, I, it's a word I struggle with, the word wrath, especially when it's tied to God and, and, and what it might mean. And, and maybe if you're not a Christian, maybe this is the thing that you've heard before and actually puts you off Christianity. You think, well, what, what's wrath got to do with it? Surely, surely we just, we just want to talk about the nice things about God. His love, his mercy, his forgiveness. So I wonder how you feel or how you felt as Graham read those verses when a number of times we hear the word, the wrath of God. I wonder whether hearing the word wrath scares us Maybe we simply just try and avoid it because we don't have to think about it in any serious measure. Maybe the wrath of God actually brings you comfort. Think about that a bit later on, why that might be the case. Maybe you think wrath is harsh. Maybe you think these descriptions, whatever they mean, just sound a bit harsh. Maybe you actually deep down in your heart wish that the word wrath was just not mentioned anywhere in the Bible at all. Because then it would be so much easier. Sharing the gospel with somebody, sitting down and reading the Bible, would just be a breeze maybe if there was no judgment, no wrath, no punishment from God. But even though these chapters are pictures, even though these chapters are visions, even though they are symbolic, they do tell us that the wrath of God is reality. These chapters tell us that the wrath of God will be fully and finally poured out, and they tell us on who. But also what these chapters tell us is that God's wrath is the outworking of his perfect justice. So look at verses 3 and 4 of chapter 15. Again, it says, They held harps, these are those who stood by that sea that looks like glass. They held harps given to them by God, and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come to you and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. In these verses, we've got the first of many links back to the book of Exodus. The song of Moses and of the people of Israel in Exodus 15 sings in a very similar manner to this. And that song in Exodus 15, if you're not familiar with the book of Exodus, is is sung when the people have crossed over the Red Sea on dry land because God parted the waters and enabled them to escape. And it's sung after those same waters have been released by God back over their enemies, the Egyptians who oppressed them and kept them as slaves, and they are drowned in the waters. And it, it's those two events, their own salvation as God's people and the punishment of their enemies... That prompts the song in Exodus 15. You can go and read the whole song. We haven't got time to read it now. But that's what Israel delights in. Delights in their own rescue and the defeat of their enemies. And so for this to be said that this is 
The song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb means that it's doing exactly the same thing. It is praising God for his salvation and at the same time praising him for the fact that he is going to judge the world in justice. Verse 4 says, doesn't it, he is holy he's, and it's about his righteous acts that have been revealed. But interestingly, that's not the only place in these two chapters where we're told that the wrath and judgment of God are actually a good thing. So after the third of the seven bowls of wrath is poured out, we get this, what feels like a little pause in the, in the story or in the progression of the story. And in chapter 16, we find these words spoken by the angel. You are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were. For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So first, an angel declares that the Holy One is just, that the punishments that are being poured out are deserved. And then second, the altar in heaven responds in agreement, declaring that the Lord God Almighty is true and just in his judgment. And that altar, if you rewind your mind back to chapter 5 of Revelation, points us to the martyrs, those who've been killed for their faith in Jesus, whose souls are under, the, under that altar, who cry out for justice. Now they cry out and say, just and true and right are the judgments of God. Whatever our thinking was about the word wrath or God's wrath, before looking at these chapters, one thing that at least these two songs or statements tell us about it is that God's wrath is right and that God's wrath is just and that there is nothing unfair about it. That's what God's word tells us about it. That's what those who are around in these visions say. If God's wrath and judgment... In the last chapter, chapter 14, and here in 15 and 16, make us cringe or feel uncomfortable, I wish that it wasn't in the Bible, what are we going to do? Because that might be still how we feel. We might go, okay, these chapters say that it's right and true, but it, it still doesn't quite sit right with me. So what are we supposed to do? I think, first of all, we've got to realise that if God's word is true, then we've got to believe it. In one sense, it's, that's quite simple. But then we've got to figure out, well, why is it that it still then makes us feel what we feel? And I think there's a few reasons. One is, we've got to realise that the seriousness of sin is greater than we realise. We've also got to realise that the outrage of rebellion against the God who made us and who loves us is outrageous. It is outrageous to rage against the creator and the sustainer and the one who can redeem us. We've also got to realise that God's holiness is more awesome than we can possibly imagine. In the truest sense of awesome. We've also got to remember that God's hatred of evil is pure and holy. That actually God's wrath is the outworking of his love, his perfect holy love against sin and evil. We've got to realise that if we could see sin and wickedness in evil in the same way as God sees it, we would respond in the same way. We'd sing with those stood by the sea of glass. We would join with the angel who speaks after the third ball. We would be standing side by side with the martyrs as they declared what they said. Or we'd say what the Israelites said. In Exodus 15, verse 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? And the answer to that question is no one. There is no one like God. God's wrath is essential to his being perfectly just. Now I think all of us can look at the world, can't we, and lament Lament at the absolute mess that the world is in. All of us can see that there are evil people and evil systems causing extreme suffering and immense heartache. None of us surely can be blind or oblivious to the horrific circumstances around the world or even nearby 
caused by human sin. All of us should want justice to be done. Surely we cannot be called and unmoved by what we see in the world around us. But I wonder actually if those of us who have seen and experienced the depth of human sin close up and personal actually find the idea of God's holy wrath and justice more comforting than those who haven't. I reckon if you've lived through the horrors of war, you understand more that God's justice and wrath is, is right and you want it to come. I reckon if you've suffered abuse at the hands of people who were supposed to look after you and protect you, you want God's justice and his wrath to come. I reckon if you've lost a loved one to murder or had someone in your family have a, a heinous crime committed against them, you want God's justice and wrath to come. I reckon if your life has been ruined by malicious lies, then you want God's wrath and justice to come. God is going to bring perfect justice. Often our justice is either weak because we don't understand the seriousness of sin or our justice is vengeful. Because actually what we want to do is take revenge. But when it comes to God's justice, God's justice is neither weak nor vengeful. God's justice is perfect. Perfectly fair. But then you might say, well, look, if God's, if God's wrath and justice is perfectly fair, if God hates sin and evil and wickedness so much, if God is going to deal with it all, why doesn't he just do it now? Why doesn't he just do it now? In fact, why didn't he do it last week? Why didn't he do it a thousand years ago? Why, did he, why is he still waiting? The Bible tells us that he's waiting because he is patiently waiting and allowing people time to repent and take refuge in Jesus. That's why. He is waiting till it is absolutely necessary. And God's wrath is able to wait because God's wrath is not like our anger. Our anger can switch, can flick on, can't it? You may well have experienced people whose anger rises in an instant. People who lash out. That's not what God's doing here. God doesn't lash out. God's wrath is his settled response to evil. And it is God's wrath that is the foundation for any hope that we have that all of the injustices that we've experienced, all of the injustices that we see in the world will be dealt with fairly. If we want to see justice... We need to understand that justice comes through God's wrath. Either God's wrath that is poured out on the Lord Jesus on the cross, therefore borne by him for all who have turned from their sin and trusted in him, therefore dealt with there, Jesus bore that wrath so that people could be forgiven, or for those who have not turned and trusted in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of their sins, they will bear the wrath themselves as these verses and some of the rest of Revelation describe. God will deal with all injustice, either at the cross or at the end. Because he sees it all. He never forgets it. There's nothing that has been done to you, as horrible as it might be, as unfair as it might have been, that God will not have dealt with by the end. It will either have been dealt with because the perpetrator will have turned and trusted in Jesus and been forgiven, which is all of grace. The same grace that you need, that I need from Jesus for all of my sin and all of your sin. Or it will be dealt with on the final judgment day when Jesus will right all the wrongs and act in justice against all the injustice. That's why God's wrath here, is, as hard as it sometimes is to read, is something we need to know and we need to believe. Because without that, there is no foundation, not only for our forgiveness if we've trusted in Jesus, to believe that he has taken the wrath that we deserve, but also to know that there is any justice for all the injustice that we see that isn't dealt with in the world. 
But after thinking about God's wrath and the fact that it is a reality and the fact that it is needed and that it should be a comfort to us if we want to see justice done, we also need to see how God's wrath is going to be poured out according to these pictures. So jump to verses 5 to 8 of uh, chapter 15. Seven angels, seven plagues come from the presence of God. They're dressed a bit like Jesus is in chapter 1. Basically, they're representing his holiness. Their clothes symbolize that. And they are given seven bowls filled with the wrath of God. Now, where else did we see golden bowls in Revelation? you remember? Back towards the early chapters, the golden bowls were filled with incense that were the prayers of the saints. And now there are golden bowls that are filled with the wrath of God. And I think the point that Revelation makes is there is a link between the two. The prayers of the saints for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done, for God's justice to be carried out on those who have murdered his people, is his wrath. And so God answers that prayer ultimately in the end. Because God is going to rid the earth finally and fully of all wickedness, of all sin and of all evil. And then chapter 16 brings us to each of the seven bowls. So the first four hit the land, the sea, the rivers and springs and the sun. Very much like the trumpets of chapter 8. Hence the reason I think there's some overlap. You get echoes of the sixth plague in Exodus. Festering sores broke out on people who had the mark of the beast and of his image. Plague only affects those who don't know Jesus. Only falls on people who have the mark of the beast. See, as God's wrath is poured out, if you've taken refuge in Jesus, there is no wrath for you to bear. More echoes of Exodus following the second and third bowl. It's death in the sea and drinking water turns to blood. And then we get that declaration, don't we, of uh, the angel about God's justice. Reminding us that however brutal and however graphic these pictures might seem, God's wrath is just. It is fair, proportional response. God is rightly angry. He's not snapped in frustration, flown off the handle. But he has been patiently waiting for people to repent through the preaching of the gospel. But as we said, he won't wait forever. He eventually must destroy sin, evil, wickedness. Then after the land and the sea and the rivers and the springs, the sun is hit with the fourth ball, as we've already said, but rather than it being darkened like with the trumpets, it is intensified. Sun scorched people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat. They cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but refused to repent and glorify him. It tells us that the judgment is intense. That's what the picture is. But the saddest thing about those verses is that those who suffer this from God and recognize that he's in control of it don't respond in repentance, they respond in rage. Rage against the sovereign God. They refuse to repent and refuse to turn from their wicked ways, from their worship of the beast. They refuse to glorify God, proving what John showed us in the verses before, that God's judgment is just and fair. And then the same thing happen, happens with the fifth ball as it is poured out on the beast and his kingdom, which is representative of all kingdoms that oppose God and his law and his right and just rule. That kingdom is plunged into darkness in verse 10, and yet there is still no repentance. Verse 11, they refused again to repent of what they had done. Even as the kingdom of the beast that they are worshipping, whatever that might be, whatever they're worshipping that isn't God, is plunged into darkness. It's fitting because of the deception and lies of those kingdoms. The people following them don't turn. They don't think, ah, the kingdom I was following was wrong. Look what's happening to it. God must be the right one. I'll turn and follow him. No, they, they see that their kingdom is doomed and they still refuse to repent. Which echoes the truth of Proverbs 19 verse 3 when it says this. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Once again it tells us that sin is so deep rooted that it requires a work, a miracle work of the grace of the sovereign God of the universe. 
to open blind eyes, to grant faith and a new heart. The sixth bowl is then poured out on the river Euphrates. The water is dried up. Impure spirits that look like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and go out to all of the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle against the Lord Almighty. So you remember we've got that unholy trinity there again. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet, trying to mimic, image God because they want to be God. They want to be in charge. And then here are these frogs that come out of their mouths representing the demonic and deceptive nature of their words. And they convince all of those who are already opposed against God to try and gather together and fight against him. Now, I don't think what we're looking for is, is the Hollywood picture of every army on the earth gathering together with their flags and their tanks and whatever, you know, kind of technical stuff they have by then, stealth bomber, you know, all these new drones, whatever else. I don't think it's that. I don't think we're going to find that somewhere on the earth and have this massive battle with God stood there and they're surrounded by tanks and planes. I think that's what it's talking about. I think what we're talking about here is a big and I guess a final spiritual battle against God and his people who represent them on earth. They will oppose God with everything they've got. There's no point in shooting a rocket at him, is there? But like, they will oppose God and God's people, his church, with everything they've got. But just as Ahab was deceived by a lying spirit to go into battle and end up in his death, so the kings of the earth, so all of these other alternative empires, whatever they worship, they've been deceived and deluded by Satan and his minions to fight against the triune God. Because this battle is the day of the Lord. And on that day there is only one winner. And before John continues that line of thinking, we'll come back to it in a second. Notice that there's this, what feels like, again, a random interjection. But it's important because at this, at this end, there is a need to listen to the words of Jesus for those who know him. Look at what it says. Verse 15 of chapter 16. Look, this is Jesus speaking. I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. What the heck does that mean, you might say? Well, Jesus coming like a thief is a picture that's all over the New Testament. Matthew 24, 43, Luke 12, 37, 1 Thessalonians 5. And we understand that picture, don't we? Coming like a thief in the night. There is no warning. Anybody ever been broken into in their house or their car or whatever else? Right? My house was broken into when I was a kid, when I was little. I was about eight-year-old, nine-year-old. The thief didn't drop a note through the door to say to my mum and dad, I'm coming back at four o'clock in the morning to nick your stuff. Did he? No. He smashed the window, he climbed in, he took my and my sister's money box and a few other things and ran off. We didn't know he was coming. If we'd known he was coming, we could have stopped him. Jesus is not going to warn us, apart from what is in scripture, that he's coming. He's told us he's coming and he's saying, be ready. He ain't giving you a time. He's not giving you a date. He's not even giving you a week or a month or a year. He's coming like a thief. So be ready, he says. Which brings us back, doesn't it, to what we asked at the beginning. Are we ready to meet Jesus? If you've not admitted that you're a sinner and you've not repented of your sin, of all your rebellion against God, whether that has been overtly hatred towards him or simply ignorance of him, if we've not turned from that sin and asked for Jesus to forgive us, then we are not ready to meet Jesus. If we've not believed that Jesus is the only way to be saved and we have not run to him for mercy, then we are not ready to meet Jesus. If you have already done that, if you have already said that you want to trust Jesus, that you want him to forgive your sins, that you know he's the only way, but actually your life currently is living in complete contradiction to that. There is no evidence of that. You're not bothered about your sin, not bothered about serving God, not bothered about honouring the name of Jesus. Then you've got to seriously ask the question, are you actually ready? And profession of faith is a great thing. 
But if that faith is genuine, it will be followed by a changed life. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. Not a perfect life, don't be wrong. Nobody in this room is perfect, however long they've been a Christian, by any stretch of the imagination. <coughs> but their lives should be changed from the day they first professed faith in Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying when he goes on to say, stay awake, keep your clothes on. In Exodus, the people of Israel ate the Passover fully clothed, everything on, ready to leave the moment they were told to get up and go. They were ready. If they hadn't been ready, they'd have missed the boat. They wouldn't have got there when the Red Sea was parted. They'd have been left behind. They had to be ready to go. That was it. It was now or never. Jesus is saying, are you ready? Be ready. Every day be ready. Not just when you think it might be time to be ready. Just be ready. Be ready today. Be ready tomorrow. Be ready next week. Be ready if you've got another 50 years living on this planet. Be ready every day to meet Jesus because nobody knows the day is coming back. If you're a Christian, to stay awake and remain clothed means to live faithfully now. In anticipation of Jesus' return. Actively waiting. Not getting sucked into worshipping false gods. Not listening to the lies of Satan, but standing on the truth of God's word. Not compromising morally to fit in with the world. Not softening the truth to make it easier to live in the world. As a Christian, are we doing that? If we are, then Jesus says... We're blessed. That's the third blessing statement, isn't it? We've got seven. And you've got three so far. They I told you to come thick and fast at the end. We are blessed. We are ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Which brings us back to the war. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, depending on how old you are, you will be thinking 1998 film, Bruce Willis, Armageddon, massive meteor coming to the earth, going to destroy it. For some of you, be like, I've never seen it. I don't know what that film is. Well, it doesn't matter because it's nothing to do with this, okay? At all. That isn't what Jesus is talking about here. This is not what John is talking about. We're not looking for a giant meteor on NASA's kind of, you know, satellites and whatever else. We're also not looking for Bruce Willis to save us either. They are gathered together literally at the place that is called Mount Megiddo or the city of Megiddo. Now interestingly, Megiddo is a plain, not a city or a mountain. And so I think Jewish readers of this, when they first read it, would have known that. They would have known, therefore, that John is talking about something symbolic here. He's not saying, go and find Megiddo because that's where the end is happening. He's making a point. It's a symbolic point. That's why he describes it as a mountain or a city, depending on exactly how you translate it. The point is, God has set the stage. The kings of the earth might think they're setting the stage for this final war, but God has set the stage. And when, he enters the, when his enemies enter the stage, he wins. No matter how big and strong they are, doesn't matter how many of them they are, doesn't matter how powerful and influential they are, doesn't matter how many plans they've got, how clever they think their battle strategy might be, doesn't matter, how, doesn't matter about any of it. Because God will win this battle. I said it again, and I'll say it again, and you'll be sick of it. You might even have it in your brain as you sleep. But the big point of revelation is Jesus wins, and if you're a Christian, live faithfully, Endure to the end in him, and if you're not a Christian, turn and trust him now, because he's going to win. The seventh angel then pours out his ball into the air. Out of the temple comes a loud voice saying, it is done. And we get lightning, thunder, earthquake. Earthquake like no one has ever seen before. The great city, Babylon that is, is split and destroyed. Islands flee away, mountains disappear. Huge hailstones fall, and again we get the unbelievably sad reminder that those who were there cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Still no repentance. With that last ball as it's poured out in the air, potentially we are reminded of what Paul says in Ephesians 2, that the air is the dominion of Satan, the prince of the power of the air he is described as. But now Satan and everything that he has ruled over is crushed. The voice from the temple, God speaking, says, It is done. Nothing left to do now. Finished. 
very much like it is finished as Jesus declares on the cross that salvation is won and the thunder and the lightning and the earthquake are all symbolic of God's awesome holy presence and power and the terror that it is to enter that. This is the final judgment. The great city Babylon, as we're going to find, described very clearly in the next couple of chapters, is stripped of its power and destroyed. And literally, as the world as we know it unravels, there is still an opportunity to repent and believe right up to the end, but we're told people curse God on account of it. See, the judgment of God, hearing about the wrath of God, this morning does one of two things to our hearts. There's no, there's no in between. It's one or the other. It either softens our heart or hardens our heart. Like the sun on a really hot day. And I know we don't get that many in the UK. But on a really, really hot day, like we had a couple of Julys ago and schools were shut because kids couldn't go in because it was too hot and all that. On that day, the tarmac melts because it's hot. But any soil at the side of the road that's next to it cracks and hardens. That's the picture that I have in mind. One of two things happens. Either when we hear about God's judgment, our hearts are softened to see that God is perfect and awesome in his holiness and right and just in his judgments. And, and we trust him. Or our hearts are hardened. And like these people in these verses, we continue to rebel against him and curse him. So the question is this morning, is your heart hardened or softened by the message of God's judgment and what will become? If you can see the foolishness of cursing God in these verses, the foolishness of those who instead of submitting to God's loving rule, stand and rail against him. If you can see the stubbornness of the human heart by nature in this passage and know that ultimately your heart is the same, then please this morning turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. Don't dig your heels in. Don't have a toddler tantrum. Don't be a stubborn teenager. <coughs> Repent. Repent and believe in Jesus as the only saviour that you need. You cannot sort a way out by yourself. Jesus has made the only way by dying on the cross, by bearing the wrath of God for those he came to save, for those who will turn from their sin and trust in him for eternal life. And so the warning of God's judgment cries out to those who don't know him yet. Come to Jesus today. Don't wait. Don't think, ah, he says he's coming like a thief, but I've got plenty of stuff I want to do first. I'll have a think about this later. Don't wait. Don't delay. Let Jesus rescue you today. Submit your life to his loving leading today. But if you do know Jesus as Lord and Savior, well, you don't need to live in fear of the wrath of God. Because the wrath that was reserved for you has been poured out and absorbed by Jesus. There's none left for you to pay. There's none left to fall on you. It all fell on Jesus. Instead, what is poured on you is love and mercy and grace. First Thessalonians 9 says, To those who believe, for God has not destined us for wrath but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.